All right, welcome to episode 15. We've got that far uh, of Honest to a Malt with Mike, myself, Duncan, and this week featuring Dan Humphrey of Summerton Club. And now it's time for the main event of the podcast. Introducing first a whiskey entrepreneur forged in St. Albans, a man who's proudly half Austrian, not Australian. You say gross. Got not good day, mate. A keen traveler of countries, and so perhaps also time. Who will skate rings around you before whipping up a new dish in the kitchen? What's he cooking at Summerton Club? Something delicious! Dan Humphrey! Hello. Ahoy. How are we? I'm grand. How are you doing? We're very good. Very good. Well, it's a real pleasure to have you on, Dan. Thanks very much for making time. Second guest ever. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. So, <laughs> so it's usually a tradition for uh, Mike to do the episode title so people know what we're going to talk about. So Mike, what's, the, what's it called today? Summer Slappers featuring Summerton. The Black Fox remix. Very That's DJ. That's going to be a hell of a lot to type. Yeah. <laughs> Get those fingers really working. It's just little um, 100 odd <laughs> characters. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to do the... That'll be just just a tweet, we'll have the title and that's it. <laughs> and the rest is just a mystery. We might have to fit some of it into the description, we'll work it out later. <laughs> so we're, um, we're doing uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Whiskey Slaps, uh, or Jeff Slaps. I hope that's not also his... If he, if he does online dating, I hope that's not his uh, online dating tag. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's never getting swiped on if his, his name Probably is Jeff not. Slaps. Anyway, he was but, kind of... Or get loads from a certain <laughs> part of the community. Very like niche. That. So he's, yeah. he's given us a shout out and done um, five some whiskeys. I love his YouTube channel, just to be clear. I love what he does. Well worth checking out. Very entertaining. Yeah. Anyway, so we're going to do our five some whiskeys. We're going to do usual what's in our glass, what's been annoying us. And we're also going to have a wee chat with Dan, which is going to be lovely. And uh, then we're going to have Black Fox Distillery on. Am I right? You are right. Coming on later at some point. Dan sorted us out. Yeah. We've, we've made the guests do the work. Mm. Yes, we have. <laughs> It is good. I've just, I've just borrowed a couple of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, right. Can you talk like a Canadian? Yeah. It's like American, but just say, ooh. Yeah. Just put, <laughs> just put an ice hockey top on. You've got it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, dear me. Dan, in true traditional style, I've done you a Summerton rap. Would you like to hear it? Of course. I don't know if you two can do me a beat. You probably can't. So we'll just go for it a cappella. Uh, here we go. It's it may not be the right beat though, Mike, what you're doing. That could put me off, couldn't it? Is that working? Um, no. Would you like a second one on top of it? Yeah. Right, here we go. The Summerton Club. The Summerton Club, it's in play. For a 50 quid sub, they want to make your day. Ain't no whiskey found on supermarket shelves. It's picked by Santa and packed by elves. Every two months you get a new bottle. Don't overthink it, you're not Aristotle. Free postage included because the decent folk plus Discord on Facebook to call people woke. Bah, bah, bah. Awesome. That You're welcome, Dan. Yeah. That. You're welcome. Do you know Duncan's Sorry. unemployed? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's got a lot of time. We'll be hands. seen at this rate, yeah. <laughs> can I borrow that by any chance? I've got yeah. to figure out how we advertise ourselves, and I don't do there it very well, so you can have a go. Yeah, you're welcome. Do it by means of rap. Yeah. yeah. Problem is, whenever I do that stuff, I always want to put an American accent, and then I decide that's a really bad idea, and so my voice just. Do, do you want to do it again with an American nah. accent? See how that I goes. Tell you what, it's relevant <laughs> if you make it Canadian. Yeah. Oh yeah, go for it! I can't. Drake, we should do it to a Drake backing track. I mean, I'm gonna pretend I know who that is. Drake is like a no, massive Canadian uh, rap uh, rapper, like hip hop star. I mean, He's Drake is. A lot. There's three big exports from Canada. One, Rush the band. Two, Drake, and three, Trailer Park Canadian, Boys. Canadian Canadian club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Canadian club as well. I don't mean physical products. I mean like arty products. <laughs> <laughs> Trailer park porch. Oh God! Yeah. Don't could you come up with some good suggestions? <laughs> that went more. That went more Sesame Street. Yeah. Someone recommended it to me and went, "It's a Northern Irish show." <laughs> I spent the first episode so confused and started looking online to see if I'd got the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, like, it's just a remake. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of series of it. That's the only thing. It's a real commitment. If, you, if you're one of those people who yeah. want to watch everything, you've got to commit to a lot of time. And there's an animated series. It's gone a bit silly. Loads now, of specials. Yeah. It's Movies. pretty much endless. But they're making money. You've got to like take it out <laughs> off to them. Mm. Pop. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 
I'm on a screw cap. There's no popping at the moment. I can try. I've got. I've, I've bought the glass popper. Oh yeah. Is a little. Is a little one. I've got. A, I know. I know. We're on a slight detour here, but I've got to ask you: What is the coin on top of the bottle about? Is it like? Is it like in the Joker? Uh, um, in Batman, with is it Two Face? Is that what he's called? Yeah. And if you take the coin off, it's like um, it's a sort of live or die type thing. I haven't figured it really out yet. Have you taken it off? Because you only get it 24 hours before you die if you haven't done the. Uh, <laughs> oh shit! Oh shit! Yeah, this is what some <laughs> this is what Summerton clubs are really about. Yeah, no one knows some... that like, we don't grow because I've slowly killed off two th- like two thirds of the whiskey. Two thirds of the members. I don't understand why subscriptions keep dropping every no, month. No, by they're, half. they're not dropping. It just keeps it flat. <laughs> just, just keep dead. just keeps it oh, flat. Yeah. yeah. It's just like one in, one out. That's the policy. People just don't know that's the policy. <laughs> but the one uh, talking about the coin, this is one of the things that makes Black Fox so awesome. On the back of it is a serial number. If you put the serial number into their website, yeah, it gives you the data about your cask. All oh, right, including okay. which is one of the things I find so interesting about them: the temperature variation. Now. Because oh, no our bottling is bigger ah. than one batch, I can't tell you exactly what's in that cask that was in yours. Mm-hmm. But one of the ones um, I looked at today, I think it was minus forty two to plus forty <laughs> degrees. I I literally I, I I I have a question that I really want to ask them connected to that when we get to it uh, when we when we have mm. them on a little bit. So I'm excited to speak about that. Um, Why didn't you build a warehouse? <laughs> no, yeah. no, that isn't the question. But I mean, I sort of, I sort of, you know. But a question connected to it. But I'm gonna. I might have a chance to sing again, but I'm gonna be like, "What's in your cask? <laughs> What's in your?" <laughs> it is your t- Mike. Do you want to do proceedings? Uh... Uh, yes, and again, so I will start by asking the guest. So, Dan, what is in your glass? What's in your glass, Dan? What is in your glass? Hang on. Let's, we've done this the wrong way. Let's say, let's talk about the club first. Oh, yeah. Then you can say, this is the club bottle. That's going to be a more sensible way to listen to it, I reckon. Why don't you do an, a short intro for yourself, Dan, and then we'll do what's in your glass. Yeah? Hi, I'm Dan. I run a full bottle whiskey subscription, which every two months sends something unique, special, a surprise to whiskey drinkers homes um the idea is that you don't know what's coming in advance and i go and do all the hard work searching for whiskey so you get it cheap and if you bought it for yourself and i like you to go oh did not expect that um <laughs> as much as possible for many different reasons like there'll be one earlier in the year that how the hell did you get it at that price another one is what is that i've never <laughs> even heard of that cool <laughs> Well, I can't wait to figure out what that is. And that, you know, each time is a slightly different ooh, experience. Yeah. That is what Summerton Whiskey Club is. It's that, oh, love it. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. I did actually, I did actually have that recently because when the bottle arrived and I opened it up, I went, I did, I went, oh, did you sit on it? What on earth is that? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? And then, um, you know, obviously we've, we've tried it and stuff. And um, yeah, we post our tasting notes and we really enjoy it. So, Decent. so where I interrupted you, so Dan. Speaking of your club, what is in your glass? Uh, what's in my glass is our latest club bottle, which came out the other day. It's um, from the Black Fox Distillery, SC11, single grain Canadian whiskey. And the grain is triticale, which is a hybrid of rye and wheat. So you get some of the rye, spicy herbal notes, but there's a mellowness to it. Um Ah. So I saw someone recently describe it as similar to a high rye bourbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I I did actually say I, I didn't know the detail of that, but I did actually say it tastes a bit like a cross between a bourbon and a rye. It uh, may well be uh, yours. Yours is that I'm. Re- I'm re- oh, recommend- don't don't take anything I'm saying. I'm just making it up. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> take take some notes of someone that knows what they're talking about. <laughs> that's what they're all. That's what all the taste notes are. It, it had a sort of making it up. a wine cask vibe to me as well. That's what I said. Um, mm. But uh, but really um, good tasting notes uh, are coming off it. Definitely very interesting for sure. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. How about yourselves? What are you? What's in your glasses? So I have gone for another grain whiskey, which we didn't plan. 
Um, and it is the Baines Single Grain South African uh, whiskey. And it is one of the cheapest, just best value whiskeys you will get out there. I am Welsh. I am all about getting stuff for as low as I possibly can in terms of money. And this is a banger. You'll pick it up on um, Amazon for like 24 quid generally. You can obviously get it elsewhere, but sometimes it goes even lower than that on offer. And um, yeah, great whiskey, great distillery. The guys behind it, really, really lovely guys. Ex-cricketer. Um, and yeah, it is, um, and it's a lovely dram. Yeah. He's also a Sheffield Wednesday fan. And that's one of the things we talk about in the background is about Wednesday. It's really he's, uh, cool. no That guy's yeah. a, he's a real hoot, that guy. And the yeah, ledge. I, I learned Absolute something ledge. at the distillery when I went and visited them. And that was that the South African grain has a uh, corn has a higher sugar content than American corn, right? Uh, and that's one of the big impacts on their flavour and takes it away from the corn whiskey you get in America. Okay, yeah. nice. and they say that's what they say. It means it comes off the still a lot sweeter and at the higher. They probably get yeah. Meat. I was gonna say more alcohol if they coming off more sugars. They should be getting more out of it. Mm. Yeah, and mm. I, I thought that was forty six percent. It's only forty percent. Either way, another 40 that's a good whiskey. Part of the 40 club. I mean, you wouldn't think it was going to be stronger than 46% at that kind of price coming over from South Africa, would you? I mean, that would be a minor miracle if it was. Well, it's... for someone that thinks that deeply into transport and stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough, yeah. Easy go lucky yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they They only produce it in a different country. <laughs> <laughs> which is one of the things that blows me away about well, this. Well, it's only down the road, but... Uh, well, that's one of the things about that's nice about this kind of uh, uh, Black Fox release that uh, we've been uh, trying is obviously it's from Canada. Don't get to drink too much unique whiskey from Canada, and that's kind of exciting. Plus, it's from a farm in the middle of nowhere um, with wild temperature conditions and stuff. So it is cool. It's very nice to be able to drink, you know, mm. whiskey from different countries. What's in your glass, Dunk? Well, right now I'm drinking uh, Aaron 10 from 2015. Because, you know, that's quite summery. It's light, isn't it? But I was lucky enough to go to a Japanese whiskey tasting uh, thing organized by um, Matt, a.k.a. Let's Get Ready to Dramble, uh, which was pretty cool. <laughs> so we were whipping through some Japanese whiskeys the other day. And um, other than the Black Fox, I retried the Tokai Murray McDavid. Um, yeah. Nick Gascoigne, no relation to Paul Gascoigne. He sent me um, no known relation to Paul Gascoigne. Could be, don't know. Historically, who knows? Who knows? He sent me um, the Tokai cask. I did a bit of a dram swap with him. And I've also been having a bit of the Lot Loman uh, Mizunara cask. Yeah. So that's basically what's been in my glass. Um, and in new tradition, what's been annoying me is the heat. <laughs> I, oh, I, I feel like I need I'm to in, change T-shirts just when I walk to the fridge and open it. I'm in here now and I was like, oh, it's, the weather's cooled down a little bit today. So I'll just chuck a sweatshirt on, no T-shirt underneath because I'm ghetto. Um, I am sweating buckets still. It's ridiculously humid. Is that a t-shirt or a jumper? That is a sweatshirt. Why are you wearing a sweatshirt With in the, the summer? the sleeves rolled. But why? Huh? Because you Why? i got jeans on as well. Why? Hey, I'm ready. It's evening. You're ready for winter, yeah. Yeah, you got to dress up. I'm in shorts. i got pink shorts on, t-shirt. That's it. That's all I'm going <laughs> to... I don't get that. I'm not going to a festival, mate. Did you... Well, speaking about festivals, did you... Did you... Did you watch the, the one that everyone's been talking about with Guns N' Roses? Or did you not watch it? At Glastonbury? It begins, begins with a G, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, to be fair, I have seen very little of Glastonbury. I've watched a bit of Elton John last night. Yeah. Um, And that was it. I'll catch up with the bands I actually like <laughs> in the next couple of weeks or so. It's the benefit of iPod. Yeah, yeah, I'll be catching up as well. Do you, do you see any of it down at all? Or did you not have I time? Think, uh, on Friday, I got to see the Royal Blood, uh, Foo Fighters and Arctic Monkeys. Right, nice. That was quite a nice set. Um, and it, but I did try and watch it again last night, and I because I'd recorded it on yeah. on the on, of the BBC, and I just kept on coming across bands I don't like. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> there was some random stuff on there in there every year. You go, yeah, this is the up and coming stage. You're like, that ain't going there, anywhere. There's <laughs> there, there's loads of good stuff that was on, but I, I was just going to say that there's a lot of big Guns and Roses fans, and we were even thinking about going to watch. Guns N' Roses at Hyde Park, but I was put off by the fact that Axel literally sounds like a cross between Mickey Rourke or the Bee Gees being tortured. He can't sing anymore. <laughs> and obviously, you know, he was amazing. He was an incredible singer, but he's just gone, like completely gone. 
And the other thing I've been suffering, and I don't know if you two have to put up with this, but I'm quite conscious about the amount of units you're drinking in alcohol. And in the summer, I keep getting dragged down the pub to drink really bad lager. And then I'll be having a lager and thinking that could have been that, that could have been a good pour of whiskey. Such a good point. That could have been a really good pour of whiskey, and I've just wasted two and a half units on a pint of Coors. And I'm like, wow. and then like, here's another pint. I'm do, like, that's five units. Do you know that where could I have been three good whiskeys? I went to a puppy daycare like dog parents party, and uh, basically was drinking Desperado all night. And I'm like, what that a, what a waste has not been drunk. <laughs> A good number of years. That's the tequila finish one, isn't it? Or something like that. I woke up the next day like, that was a stupid idea. Mm. That has played absolute fury with my internals. I'm not going to lie. But you know what I mean? You, does not, do you do not think about that? Like if you are if you have any kind of sort of awareness about the amount of units in alcohol you're drinking, and then you're drinking a drink that you're not really enjoying, and just thinking this is a waste of units, right? You go into a pub, surely they have more than just lager. Yeah, but it's that social thing, isn't it? I mean, I could have a Guinness. Um, I don't always if it's if it's like thirty degrees or twenty eight degrees. I don't necessarily feel like maybe I'd have a Guinness. It's a, it's a maybe, you know. Yeah, I don't mind the beer. It's that British lager but, culture. Oh no, I in the winter ales all day, but as soon as it gets like warm, I'm like, nope, I mm. want, I want rubbish lager. <laughs> I got into craft ale. But now it's like three pounds a pint more for a craft ale than it is an old man ale. Like, I used to like that when I was a teenager. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, back on the old man stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Did me in the park. I'll have a John Smith, please, darling. <laughs> Yuki, get me a Yuki Brown. Yeah, I agree with that. It's crafters. Um... Nine, ten pounds for a pint of craft ale, or six pounds for a for an old man ale. Six pounds. I was gonna say, hey, this is not Weatherspoons. This is not a tourist. Some banging ales. Not a tourism bottles. advert for St Albans at the moment. Oh, no, that's London. Yeah. I was oh, in London, London the other okay. day. Yeah. I went and had a pint of a couple of mates. Yeah. I thought I did well at £5.75. Yeah. They were like, that's not bad. Yeah, and they were eight something. I'm like, yeah, it's because I went for the, the one with a silly name. You know? Yeah. How, how else do you describe to someone who's not an, an, an ale drink, an ale drink? What do you want? Stupidest name, please. Yeah. yeah. Which, I'll, I'll have the pint where the old man that's got no money is clearly sat next to the pump. I'll have one of those. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm having. But there is quite a big difference in the ABV. You know, the, the beers you're talking about, the kind of like old ales are usually somewhere between sort of three and a half and sort of push kind of 5%. Whereas all that fancy new IPA stuff or whatever is seven, eight percent, or certainly over six. Not going to lie, yeah. you have also stumbled across the other reason why I've gone back to old man ale. I've realized I'm a lightweight. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just a lot easier to start to have the three and the four percent beers because then I can have four with my mates yeah. and not think the world's ended. I don't know where the point in your life when you just stop being able to just session because that's yeah, you know, you'd smash away like Stella's back in the day without even thinking about it. Now I'm like four beers. I am not feeling happy in that morning mm. after. I am really struggling. It's not just that; it's the volume, isn't it? We've talked about this before, but it's just too much volume. Uh, you know, the belly bloats. Oh, I think when you get, I think when you get into the habit of drinking good quality alcohol at home, like you know, like good whiskey or good wine or the odd good mm. beer, and you go out to a pub, generally it can be really disappointing because you're either paying through the nose for something you really enjoy, or yeah. you're drink, you're compromising the quality on what you yeah. can drink. And I saw someone posting online about kind of corkage in like certain restaurants and there's a Turkish locally where I live and they will actually let, uh, let you take whiskey in. So we can go and have like good quality Turkish food and take like a bottle of peated whiskey to have with us. Obviously we're drinking their beers. So it'll be like mm. Efez yeah. or whatever. Don't mind. Yeah. Don't mind having like one Efez or two Efez with a meal. Yeah. If, if I'm going to have some whiskey as well. Right. So yeah. Um, I get it. We need to do, um, Jeff, Jeff whiskey, Jeff whiskey has, uh, shouted us out. Uh, on picking five summer whiskeys. And so I thought we could do it all together, right? And also we need yeah. to do um, uh, some Jeff Slaps shout outs, which I think just involves banging a bottle like this. Treat, treating a bottle like it's done something wrong. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, where you, it's where you need a wedding band just to get that extra clink. I've got a wedding band. Yeah, I've, I do that. I've got the, uh, mine's too big for me. So I've got one of those little rubber things on the bottom. So That's your excuse for taking well. it off all the time. <laughs> no, it's the opposite. <laughs> That's, oh, you can't take it off. put it on so I can't get it off. Ah, she shrunk it. She's like, what's, what size finger are you? Like, I don't know, T. She's like, two sizes under that, please. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely the ring that's been shrunk, not my fat fingers growing <laughs> since getting married. <laughs> definitely not. Uh, 
<laughs> There's one bottle slap from me. Yeah, I bottle slapped the Aaron 10. Mike's just bottle slapped uh, the Baines. The Baines. 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 Yeah, SC11, yeah, by are. the way. That, mm. that is, um, that's the closest whiskey I'm ever going to drink to some sort of uh, gang-related postcode in uh, East London. <laughs> 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 it's got I can't I every it. time someone says S11 I'm just thinking about graffiti and tagging do you get me fam <laughs> Dan why don't you go first so you said you have one uh, what's your your favourite summer whiskeys favourite summer dram so basically Jeff recommended five summer whiskeys and the one that I remember that he picked um, was Orchard House by Compass Box that's the one yeah, that yeah. I'm going to say props to Jeff I think that's a great shout out for a summer whiskey the other four were good as well, but that's the one that um, I um, really like the Red Breast Twelve that he, he uh, suggested. Mm, I'd actually that, go with I'd go with the Lustau over the Twelve. I think mm. that would be that, my. Uh, I'm going for the Twelve. Was that his, Was that his barbecue whiskey? The Red Breast is that the one he said he'd take to a barbecue? Maybe or like a party. That's actually where I first had my my first Red Breast Twelve was at a barbecue at mine. I had a few whiskey. Was Jeff there? there? No, I wish he was because I like, literally <laughs> would have had the, had that experience together, and that's why I have a red breast twelve in my collection is because of that night, and it was in the middle of the summer, so I see it as a summer drink in that regard. And is that your favourite summer whiskey? No, favourite summer whiskey. As soon as you said we're doing summer whiskeys, I instantly knew it's the bottle that Mike's got in his hand right now. Right, oh, it's not no, not that one. Sorry, the other one oh. had the Baines. Oh, the Baines. <laughs> single grain having that i've been at the distillery and it was 40 degrees that day went back big glass of ice veins on top phenomenal it it's a, you know it's a, it's distilled in a hot country and drunk in that country you put it over ice and it just works on a proper hot day oh, that's a nice tip i can't believe we've picked the same whiskey i'm very happy with it that, that would be one? my like that would be my summer whiskey hmm. um between the sort of I, th I was trying to think of that i can't remember the conditions that jeff put on there but it was essentially mine is baines right then the artist blend by compass box right okay um and obviously i mentioned it most episodes buffalo, buffalo trace, trace. yeah nothing but like somehow finally managed to pick up a 45% ABV version. Oh, on Amazon. is that a single cask one then? No, no, it's just the exact same oh, right. that we get in the UK, but not a 40. Oh, okay. It's like, it's worlds apart. I think I've only had the 45% one. I don't know if I've had the 40% stuff. If you've had it in the UK, it's 40. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, mega. I was well happy to get that. That's decent. I definitely have bought it in the UK. So, mm. yeah, that's well, three. Right. What, are you, what are your other two then? Um. Well, one was a cocktail, wasn't it? Right. So, Old fashioned all day long. Okay. No questions. And not a peated one though. So it'd have to be um to I'd go wild turkey one oh one with your normal sort of old fashioned recipe. And that is very hard to beat. And again, a very cheap, cheap bourbon with a lot going for it. Um I can't remember the last category, but if I was gonna go somewhere completely different from those ones and go for a peated Lafroy ten. I would stick to a Lafroy 10. Uh, you can drink it all year, and that would be my peated 40%. And yeah, you know what it's going to do. I'd be more than happy with that. All right. A summer dram of Lafroy 10. So, what were the categories again? Barbecue, cocktail, the other three? I mean. So, one you take to a barbecue. Right. I think one was just general summer um, whiskey, your cocktail, and I can't remember. I just made the rest up. Right. Okay. Well, I've gone for um, uh, Tobin Mori 12. That's forty six point three percent. All of my whiskies have a commonality in which they're around forty six ish percent, except one, and that's like pears, peaches, apples. It's malty, it's oily, it's coastal, stone fruit, dates, orange zest. Orange is a really good flavour to have in a summer whiskey. I think like kind of like citrus notes more on the orange side than the lemon side. I put down the red breast the stout. Again, it's forty six percent. You know, it's Oloroso from um, the Stega the stout. You're getting like almonds, sultanas, oranges again, dates. You see, there's a theme here, right? You know, it's like it's got that substance to it. It's also a bit kind of milk, chocolate, honey, walnuts, apples, poached pear. So something which has got fruit in it, you know, maybe some oranges, some green fruits, maybe some more tropical fruits, like that type of thing at a good ABV. And both of those are non-peated. And then I've put down, because mm. I'm always plugging this, the Cotswold single malt, because that's yeah. majority ex-burbs. 
It's, I think it's got SDR and wine cask in the mix less. It's 46%. It's more cereals. Again, it's orange notes, but you're getting a little lemon in there. It's a bit grassy, floral. It's kind of creamy. You're also getting some kind of like custard notes. So I think that's a really flexible one. That you could put in most cocktails, really. Um, I would go with a blood and sand cocktail. That would be my summer choice of cocktail. And I think you could put in that any real what is blood and sand again blood and, i am not a so it's like man. it's like fresh orange juice with um uh cherry uh cherry brandy liqueur and um martini rosso right i think they're mm. the three ingredients i have to double check it because it's been like three months since i've made it yeah right but i'm generally i'll make a few of them in the summer when it's hot you shake it all together over ice pour it out obviously with the whiskey as well so it's an equal measure of each thing so it actually be fresh orange juice Martini uh, uh, Rosso, like the red martini, or might be Martino Verma, I have to check it. And then it's um, then it's the cherry brandy liqueur, right? And then it's the whiskey, all equal measures, shaken together over ice, poured out, generally in a sort of a fancy glass. <laughs> but you can put it in whatever, right? Nice. You know, you just serve it, yeah. serve it in chilled. A yeah. Now, interestingly, I've also gone for Tamdu 15. And I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> it's not just... Is it because you're now out of contract because you haven't mentioned it's no, it's be- three podcasts? No, no, seriously. But a lot of people have weddings in the summer and people always say yeah. Christmas cake, but guess what else? Wedding cake, right? Wedding cake is often you'll have the traditional wedding cake. And Tam do, it's like vanilla. It's kind of like Christmas or wedding cake, whatever you want to call it. Again, oranges, apricots, almonds, almonds, raspberries. It's a great summer whiskey. Plus, I know it's expensive, but it is great to chuck over ice as well. Right? You've stretched that one out, but I'm impressed with how you did it. Well done, sir. And then my last choice, uh, and this would be the barbecue choice, would be any first fill uh, bourbon Campbelltown whiskey, or specifically at the moment, it's not first fill. It doesn't. It's got to finish. It's the Whiteport Festival. But I think that's a really mm. good one because that Glen Scotia Festival edition, Orchard Fruits, it's coastal, sea salt, bit of smoke. You can't really go wrong. It's going to punch through your barbecue, but it's fruity as well. You could have it with any of the meals, you know, like with your Decent. dessert or your mains, or you know, find and find a find another find another Glen Scotia, which is first fill bourbon single cask, or you know, you're not going to be able to get a hold of much Springbank or a Kilcarra yeah. bourbon cask. Any Campbelltown first fill bourbon uh, would be my my fifth fifth one to go to. Decent. Yeah. So there you are. Yeah. Jeff, you have been slapped back. Yeah, you're now making me think of so many other ones. Yeah, go for it. Well, like the Stowning Maple Syrup Rye Cask. Right. It's just Ooh. so sweet. And because in the summer, I think sweet. Either light and fruity floral or just sweet. And that is the sweetest whiskey I've ever had. It smells like maple syrup. Uh, and the one we've got is 60 odd percent. So it doesn't just taste of milk maple syrup. It's got some fire to it. <laughs> it, it. It's just that smell, that first bit when you open it up, you're like, that's maple syrup. Like, mm. not, that's not maple syrup whiskey. That's maple syrup. That's yeah. So sweet. And then another one is McMira Lava. Because I'm a big fan of sweet peat. It's, uh, I think it's pork cask uh, peated whiskey. And for me, that's barbecue. Yeah. yeah, that that is my favourite way of doing peat is with a bit of sugar in there, and it just reminds me of a, of a barbecue in the summer, a bit of brisket, yeah. and then probably something like uh, Woodford Reserve, just because I drank that as a twenty something year old over so many summers. A bit of ice. You were drinking good stuff as a twenty year old. You could, you could there, pick any. You. you could pick most Solid. half decent bourbons as a summer whiskey. I think yeah. really because yeah. they're sweeter, aren't they? You know, um, I yeah. I didn't pick one because I knew Mike would, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had money on down the local bookies that you're going to say Eagle Rare 10, but you didn't. So No, I know. I, <laughs> I was like, I've embargoed myself yeah. again saying it. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. It's, I think it's good to have a whiskey that can be flexible and used in different situations, right? I mean... That, yeah, but I'm not contractually signed up like you to speak about mm, Tandu, so I'm like, I have to <laughs> give it a break now. I'm, I'm not actually contractually signed up just in case anyone wonders. I there wish I was. <laughs> there are other whiskey brands available. <laughs> So, um, is it Dan? Do you want to introduce us to Black Fox Distillery? Yeah. Hi. Well, have we been joined? Yeah, we've been joined by Barb and John from Black Fox in Saskatchewan, uh, Canada, who make phenomenal whiskey, but unique unicorn whiskey, I would say as well, because there's so many parts to it. You just go, well, that's how you do it. Is that possible? And the answer is yes. 
And it's not just yes, it's wow, yes. So Barb and John are the masterminds, the expertise, the knowledge, but also the people trying to learn more and just be better at what they're creating. And that mentality is phenomenal, particularly when your start point is being some of the best known uh, farmers in the world. So if you're making the grain yourself and then yeah. you're, you're you're involved in every single part of the process up until the point it gets shipped out in a bottle, generally, if you're trying, you know, you've got a chance of making something really, really great. And that is what Barb and John do. What an intro. That was a better, you should write for us. Yeah. <laughs> It's far better than what we're going to come up with. How are you doing, guys? Can you hear us? Are you all good? No, we're all good. You guys sound, you guys sound so professional. Here we are with the cheap laptop and sitting in. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. We're going to tell people that you were actually uh, you were on a space shuttle at the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you, you. you were actually floating um, and you were just talking into a speaker attached to the side of the, uh, the, the craft. <laughs> and you were at zero gravity. And so it was all very impressive. Yeah, well, it's very good because Canada developed an arm for the space shuttle, so you could just say this is the Canada arm. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's it. It was the drink. It was the drinking arm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we obviously thanks so much for making time to to come on and say hello. Um, Dan's done a fantastic intro for you there. So we um, we we've we tried the um, the SC eleven. We really like it, and we've done tasting notes on it. And what we thought because obviously you produce whiskey and you have a farm. Um, I don't know. Would you like to? Would you like to say something? Would you like to to do talk a bit about so your the farm chance and to big yourselves? And then we're going to ask you a few, probably ask you a few random questions about Canada. I, yeah. you, I, I'll make it a little bit easier than talk about anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about what it means to be to farm your own to create no farm your own grain from very start to finish, and then to create you know ferment and distill it. What different um areas do you have to think about compared to a standard distillery that doesn't have to worry about being a farmer right now when there's a hell of a lot of stuff to do outside because it's growing season well you know what i'm really excited that we're starting with the farming part because i want to tell you that i hate to say it but we have an unfair advantage farming grain here in saskatchewan so we are in what is considered a desert climate uh, we are hundreds, if not thousands of miles from the nearest large body of water. So we do not understand ocean faring terms or anything like that. But what it does for us is it gives us a really unique location to produce some of the, the grains that are sought after around the world. We have incredibly long days, which you guys are experiencing in the UK right now too, because we're similar latitudes. But what we have that's different from you is very cool nights. So what that tends to do is concentrate flavors a lot for us. And that's what gives us our unfair advantage. Yeah. Right. It, 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 <laughs> to like build on that a little bit. So when we got into the business, we figured, well, what do we have that's really unique? And the weather and the terroir, when you think about wine, is you know everybody dreams oh i've got the southern slope in france and i'm going to grow grapes on it and the same concept here is that here we actually have something that's really cool and as farmers typically throughout our career you you grow this stuff and you sell it by the ton it goes into uh, onto a train it goes to port and somebody else makes a whole bunch of money off it so we figured oh, yeah. oh this is <laughs> this is an opportunity yeah. to kind of strike back and Making whiskey just seemed to be the perfect storytelling device on saying, here, this is what you can do in our environment. This is what makes it different. And how do we just keep, you know, building that story up? And then we get to talk about sustainability and farming and all those things that we really enjoy. What? So how long have you been doing it? Yeah, how long have you been producing the whiskey? For oh, okay, whiskey? so we've been producing whiskey for eight years. Yeah. We've been farming for... Close to 40. Wow. And if, just another good piece of trivia, we were named Canada's Outstanding Young Farmers from a long time ago. 
<laughs> I thought you were going to say the year there. <laughs> roll, <laughs> you roll back on the year, yeah. So um, this year, away. there's a lot of old farmers out there. You're like, yeah, we're still knocking it. We're young. What I've learned so far, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. What, what I've learned so far is you you can't write coastal on the bottle because you're you're in the middle of a desert somewhere. And <laughs> in in addition to being in the middle of the desert, there's wild temperature swings. So I wondered, do and maybe you know, maybe you don't know, maybe Dan knows. Um, is there any other distilleries? in the world that experience where the whiskey is stored outside not warehoused i think because it's under the skies right where which experiences kind of swings of sort of 80 centigrade over time huge do we know <laughs> i've never heard of it any i've never heard of anyone leaving full casks outside <laughs> We see that we see they get, they get nicked ones if it was around here. <laughs> so not yeah. intentionally, anyway, I don't think, I think at one time it was probably more or less a common practice until everybody started thinking, oh, we can reduce our losses by putting it into a rick house. But even as soon as you put it into a rick house, there's such a thermal mass that you don't get the individual cast doesn't actually cool down at night. Mm. And just mm. they, it, it was kind of by happenstance that we started this way. It wasn't that oh gee we're smart right off the hop, but it's <laughs> we ended up that year we just didn't have enough money to put up a you know another warehouse. So we started this and we kind of liked it, and it was it adds that uh, a little bit of French, a little je ne sais quoi of here. What happens when a barrel gets to be? You know, minus 42 one day and the next day it warms up to you know, minus, maybe a, minus 20, <laughs> minus 20 and minus 10. And yeah. so what we've done now, we've actually put probes into some test barrels so that we can track the temperature of the liquid and the pressure on the barrel and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's very interesting. How do you guys actually stay? Say, how do you guys actually stay warm when it's like minus forty? I mean, like the, the coldest I've ever been was minus whiskey. No, <laughs> seriously, whiskey. minus minus 20 in south korea for a couple of days i just remember thinking i need to have like under trousers on two pairs of trousers and then the yeah. cold gets in your eyes and you're like i feel like my eyes are freezing and you're just walking <laughs> yeah. down the street you're not even in i went skiing in uh in banff in canada and i was going up one of the slopes and scratched my head and unclipped my goggles when i was on the ski lift and they went and my eyes had frozen shut by the time i got to the top <laughs> It's like, oh my god, what am I doing? But yeah, it's mad. Have you ever, uh, ever had any major disasters with casks if they're left outside? Yeah, we had a couple of the barrel suppliers that we had when we first started. The heads weren't made quite as strong as what you would want, and basically, it creates enough of a vacuum. It'll warp the wood up, and then you lose a whole cask kind of a thing. So we've gone to a different supplier. Now we're actually going to start making our own casks, like through a different, uh, through a, a friend of ours who has a, you know, a construction company and he's bought all the yeah. gear to start. And so we bought some oak from Ontario. We're letting it season out. So in a couple of years from now, we should be able to start making our own. Oh, no and make way. It's a little bit heavier. I, I have it's, a, it's extreme I have a, conditions. I have a really serious question to ask before I forget is have you do you or have you considered uh playing uh the casks rush <laughs> Absolutely. because my so understanding is that everyone's obsessed canada. with rush in canada they're like an absolute national treasure and then you yeah, can market it as not only terroir and the rest of it you could say the the whiskey listened to rush it was it yeah. could be the rush but oh canada's got so much talent yes. and like stomp and tom mm. connors i don't know if you've ever heard of yet but <laughs> Boy, I tell you, that would make some awfully unique whiskey. <laughs> but seriously, though, are, are you Rush fans or are you not? Because I kind of get this impression that everyone in Canada is very proud of Rush. I haven't actually ever been to Canada. It's one of the countries I haven't been to. So it's just, it's, a, it's like a me question. Uh, Rush is very popular. Uh, they've got some good songs, as does everybody. But we tend to be more of generalists and like everybody for mm. different reasons. So not are you sure you're not in politics instead of <laughs> yeah, this sounds like a that very a very good answer like a very PC answer <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's, it's very, very dodgy, you're, like, you're like you're like drake and rush equally it's cool <laughs> all, right. all right yeah one day drake one day rush and then yeah, exactly. have you got have you got animals on the farm is it is it is it an arable farm but do you have any animals there or two uh, or pets cats. that's it cats two cats two yeah. cats 
No, I'm afraid I don't have the patience for animals, although that is part of our background. So Barb is actually technically an animal nutritionist. That was her university training. And so we know the industry quite well, but I, like I say, I don't, uh, I, I have no patience for that. Mm. No. This whiskey you've made is very rich, isn't it? It really, um, very full bodied. Uh, we felt like it was somewhere between this um, SE11 single grain. Um, thank you, Dan. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's super rich. It feels like somewhere between a, a bourbon and a Ryan. I said it kind of has like a, a sort of wine cask vibe to me. You, um, and, and after a few days of being open, there's, there's a slight strange note in the finish and that sort of goes. And then it really becomes quite a, like a rounded whiskey, I think. It's just kind of quite powerful. And um, whatever taste notes you're getting, because it's very subjective, but ultimately the right kind of balance between sweet and um, sour. Is that? So it's interesting when you look at the genetics of triticale, so it's a wheat and the rye hybrid, you actually get flavor components coming from both the parent plants. So you, you have that one seed and it's got those flavorings of rye, but there is those undertones of, you know, the grassiness, the sweetness that you would expect from a weeded bourbon. And it's it's quite interesting. Mm. Yeah. I think my, just to dive into my tasting notes, I think on the palate, I said I got a bit of uh, a bit of pine, um, undiluted orange squash or orange concentrate, as you might say over there. A um, bit of an effervescence. Uh, there's a herbal note in there, which I said is a bit sort of like vermouthy, sort of like martini, but then ginger and grassy. So yeah, exactly as you said. Mm. I got like, I said it was dark cherries, oranges, caramel and porridge on the nose. Light and fizzy on the palate, green eight, green grapes, sweet and bitter orange, some herbiness, um, semolina pudding, it made me think, kind of like a bit of a muted sweetness. And I said the finish was kind of plum sour, orange liqueur, lots of caramel, white refined sugar, and then a slight oaky note develops. And yeah, somewhere between kind of sweet, bitter and sour. But uh, a loads of cigar tobacco on the finish. Oh, yeah. Lovely. Maybe. I, yeah. I do like this way because, like with bourbon, you know, my minimum fifty one percent corn, but then you have or like you have the riders and you have all these mixtures. Instead of mixing the grains together, why don't we take one step earlier and then yeah. mix the grain genetically and go? This is what I want. So you've taken the blending out of it. It's genius. Yeah, I yeah. love this. Can you put cherries into grains, please? So that's the one little bit I'd like to have more of in whiskey. It's just more cherry. Yeah. You would be amazed to know what a plant breeder can do because yeah. when they basically when they, they make a cross, they'll end up with a hundred different grains out there and off the one cross. And basically it's up to whoever's doing the breeding to, yeah. to choose what they to like. Choose what they like. So typically they're driven by the economics they want more yield and more efficient and stuff like that. And we've been really concentrating on flavor. So this variety in particular was a, an old fella that had done a bunch of plant breeding here in Saskatchewan. They were actually trying to select grain for distilling and they developed this grain and then they, they, they kind of forgot to do the marketing behind it. And so it sat on somebody's shelf and nobody, really nobody grows it. It's, it's quite interesting. So there is, there's absolutely opportunity. And Daniel, you asked, like, you know, the the idea of going straight from grain to distilling and, you know, the different complexities of it. I think farmers kind of tend to make good distillers because we're used to thinking really long term. So when we look at here, we want to change our plans and the way that we farm. You're looking at a 10 year kind of a plan all the time. And I know a lot of my friends who have gotten into distilling, you talk to them about making whiskey and it just scares the pants off them because <laughs> they can't think of what they're doing next year, let alone what they want to be doing. In yeah. You could say maybe arguably uh, either farmers or engineers make good people to make whiskey because they're both into planning. Yeah. I noticed, um, is that the Canadian flag on the bottom of the bottle there? Or it's is it Canadian the maple leaf. You the maple leaf. The maple leaf. Sorry. I meant and the maple so leaf. Not a problem, but also when you look forward at the base of the a mountain range, yeah, it's well actually it's not mountains because Saskatchewan doesn't have mountains. We have Saskatchewan snowdrifts. That's right. where they are because they're not big enough to be mountains. <laughs> so that was the intent there. This Love this it. bottle is actually um, 
really nice and I think would, would make a lovely decanter to keep after you've finished the whiskey. So it, it would be one that I won't be recycling. I will be keeping as a de- sort of a, a decanter, mm. basically, yeah. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the coin on top and the serial number and the, the ability to kind of look back in the history of the whiskey. Like Daniel, you really you trying to use it, yeah? I haven't used it yet. I, I didn't. So well, I mean, <laughs> Dan told us about it on the call earlier. Yeah. And I was like, what? Because obviously Duncan was very kind to just pour me some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no, there's no coin uh, in mine. <laughs> so I have to be, a, I have to be a little honest here in that I. In I left her. No, 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 I wasn't going to say that. I was just going to be really honest. So for me as a whiskey drinker, I do drink, try a lot of whiskeys. I, I really appreciate the story. And I think, look, for example, there's um, like Darth Mill in in, uh, in the UK or like uh, Kilhoman. These are kind of farm-based distilleries. And I really like their stories as well. But really what matters to me more than the story is the product. And if I love the product and I love the story, then it's a winner, if you see what I mean. And so I do really like the product. Um, uh, but then I also like bourbons and rice. So I'm, yeah. I'm in the... Uh, I'm in the marketplace, right? I, you know, <laughs> I'm in the I'm in the zone. At least I'm in the right ballpark, as we say, right? So, um, I will scan it and try it, um, and I, I think that it's great if whiskey is more kind of traceable, generally. But that isn't my number one reason for wanting to get whiskey. What I do really value about what you guys do is the sustainability element of it, right? And I think if places are more sustainable in everything, packaging, experience, um, you know, uh, not being wasteful. Um, that I buy into as a consumer, right? You know, places that do too much packaging, I think is a bit unnecessary. And I think one of the things though, with with the coin and the serial number is the reason you don't treat it at the same level as the other bits is because no one else does it. Am I going to lose a nail getting this coin off, by the way? No, I just <laughs> did. I spent longer trying to get the glue off than I did the, the coin off the top because I wanted the coin without the glue. <laughs> but no one goes to this level of detail you get to know how many hours of sunshine were directed at your cask over its lifetime. You get to know the very maximum, the peak, top and bottom temperature. These are things we just don't get told by anyone. So where do I go to type this in? I've got the I've got the serial number. Do I go to the website? Uh, yes, correct. I love it. I'll... See, these things, like, I know a lot of people we do tastings with are, like, absolute whiskey nerds. And... They would be, if your coin could tell them what shoe brand you were wearing on the particular day you were like looking at the cast, they would love it. So there are people out there that oh, people love it. That's will love, absolutely adore all the information they can get hold of and they will just absorb everything and really buy into it. So that's, yeah, anything like that. I know other people do QR codes and things, but especially with that coin, it does sign, you know, it sets you out differently from anyone else and no one else is doing it. And you've got a little memento, which is always cool to keep. So it's interesting because, like, when we started this business, 90% of Canadian whiskey is made from American corn. And we said, well, geez, that's not really Canadian whiskey. And we used to ship, when we first started farming, a lot of our barley would go to Scotland for whiskey. You know, you're selling rye. We are an exporting nation. But to be importing that much corn and just making, basically, you're making bad bourbon and trying to, you know, sell it as Canadian whiskey would kind of seem a, a bad move to us. So it became all about here, what can we actually grow in our field? So we use beyond triticale, we're using rye, we've done oats, wheat, and but these are things that actually fit into our crop rotation that, that the farmers are growing out in the field. So the story then becomes around here, what are good farming practices? What's actually being grown? What are the resources that you have? And that's it's been a really fun, fun experience to trying to de- develop a real sound, you know, kind of methodology to what you're trying to produce. What do you think is like the longest uh, maturation you'll get away with, with the way it's aged? Do you think it's, you're just going to lose everything if it goes over a certain period? Well, I think right now my gut feeling is like we've had some, you know, right from the very first. And I would say it's starting to get a little bit too oaky. It was, we were talking about with that, that with Dan this morning. Is but that- it's also because we use new oak. We don't use used barrels. We always use brand new barrels. Yeah. So we're probably going to start exploring here after we, you know, after we disgorge a barrel, we'll start reusing some, some of them. 
yeah, do some first bills. And then, you know, as you go forward, that's the interesting part of this business. It takes so long to see what the effect is going to yeah. be. We've got some that we put into, we had gotten some, uh, some Grenache casks uh, a couple of years ago that we're going to try and keeping. We put five-year-old whiskey into that. And we're, that was two years ago. And we're going to see how that works out. And it, now it's about playing around, but I have a gut feeling that five to seven years is going to be kind of that yes, sweet spot probably. because it's still going to pick up the grassy notes and some of those things. And I think you'll age, those things will age out and make the whiskey, it'll taste older, but I think it'll taste less yeah. interesting. And I think interesting is better, trumps older. That's it. You you pull it when it's ready, basically. And that's that's the best way to be. Don't focus on focus on the age. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really good. I've I've actually got here, I've managed to get the certificate of provenance up. So uh it like it says um the serial number, I've got that, which is uh I won't read it out, but then and the minimum storage temperature is minus forty two point five, the maximum storage temperature is forty point one, hours of bright sunshine, one hundred and forty four thousand, no, uh, fourteen thousand uh, four hundred and twelve. Point nine, very specific. <laughs> Crop year was 2014. The grain type we've already said, which is uh, Chico Secole. Is that right? Did I say that right? Probably not. Um, I'm not an expert in grains. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, I want you to say it, not I want you to say it again. <laughs> well, I'm beginning with T. Um, yeah. It was distilled by uh, uh, Jay Coat. That's mm-hmm. yourself, right? That's one. That's yourself, yeah. That's and me. then... Uh, the cast type is Quercus Alba. Finishing cask are not applicable. And angel share was five point three eight percent per annum. There you go. So I've uh, mm-hmm. I found I've located it. There you go. Yeah, we find it quite. No, that's it. so. In about two weeks, there will be a different certificate with more information. So yes. don't okay, lose your keep point. it. And you can talk a bit more. Daniel's been kind of giving us some coaching on saying what oh, other information. This is you know. You may find it ordinary, but other people are going to find yeah, it. Whiskey's known in me. I yeah. Got it. When I got asked what my opinion was, I was going to say, I want more. <laughs> I've got one question I haven't asked you guys before. Are there any other grain hybrids you'd like to experiment with? Are they out there already? Or is there a grain hybrid that you think would be really interesting to try to make whiskey out of? Actually, just hold on. <laughs> okay. This was set up. No, no, I could, <laughs> because we're now getting into me being a nerd again. This is my favorite. I know what he's, what he's going to bring. This is kind of exciting because it hits a lot of different fronts from sustainability right through to the hybrid flavors to to everything else. And it's something that's rather unique. I was uh, I was remiss. I've forgotten that you were going to. Yeah. So anyway, so if you're not farmers, this may not mean much. But uh, can you see that? So yeah, uh, there's still yeah. some grass. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what it yeah. looks like. So this is the latest, greatest, innovative thing that's going on in plant in breeding. farming and plant breeding right now. So this is a perennial ryegrass that we're trying to make it to have grain quality. And the wonderful thing about it is that the plant will last for 10 or 15 years. So the farmer goes out and instead of having to disturb the soil and replant every year, he just goes in and harvests it. Like it's kind of like letting the lawn in front of your house to grow and being able to drink. So it's like it's like apples. Once a year you shake the Absolutely. tree. Absolutely. And... So no we've way. got we've got access to a little bit of it this year. By next year, hopefully we have enough that we can actually make a run of whiskey with it. But there's there's so many wow. things happening in in the plant breeding space. Like when you connect all this to agriculture, because there's the whiskey that you get, but then how about the end products that you get as well? Now we've got plant breeders that are able to develop, you know, specific proteins that we'll be able to salvage out of our just, you know, the spent grains and stuff like that that can go into either into the medicinal market or into the health food market. And there's a, a lot of really interesting stuff and being much more environmentally friendly. So again, this stuff like this takes, this will be 20 years from now. So it'll be something my kids will. It's crazy. You're mixing like the, the absolute latest sort of genetic uh, technology with what is one of the oldest traditions going as well. You've got but best you know, of both. We, when you look at the history of whiskey, it was at one time, it was a very agrarian, 
kind of a move, Probably. especially here in North America, because it was all about here, we're too far away from any markets. Let's make whiskey out of it. And then at least we only have to put two barrels onto the wagon instead of having eight horses and eight wagons of grain going, you know, yeah. through a bunch of old bad trails. So it's, it's very, yeah, it's very nice. to me, it's very interesting. Like the history has kind of come full circle and saying, you know, ours is one example of making whiskey, but we could be making pasta. We could be making, you know, anything. Right. But the whole okay. idea is, what do you have in your own reach? What can you excel at? And, you know, doing something with it. And I think if people thought that way, you would end up with a little bit more sustainability because there's some places in the world, you shouldn't, you just shouldn't be making some things because the environmental yeah. impact is huge. And I mean, that, that new crop, that could change farming because there's so many people that are struggling year on year to, to get through that harvest and then, one thing goes wrong at any point that stands down yeah. and they're not making they might be hardly mm. make any profits anyway if you take all out all that cost of taking it up and putting you in and blimey yeah so yeah. anyway so that's yeah. kind of the, <laughs> yeah. cool. there's lots of lots of interesting stuff and stuff happening in the egg space that we'll want to kind of continue on all of our friends obviously they're farmers and growing all these unique things there's always a lot of pressure for us to try a lot of new stuff it's tough being a small distillery you can only, you can do some cool stuff but you can't do too much you just can't afford to but we do more than what the big no. guys do because the big guys they just want to do it like they did it 20 years ago or 40 or 60. Well, it isn't Love you, it. Have a, you go into a separate set of needs the big guys the distillery is a factory and what you're aiming to do is to increase uh, your production uh, relative to your inputs and, uh, that, and that's perfectly understandable and you need that in an industry otherwise we couldn't ever all drink whiskey correct oh absolutely and yet it has quality implications that you wouldn't you, you wouldn't wouldn't think about you know like recycling and being efficient you end up taking those end cuts and you're you're always pushing where you think the customer is going to be happy with the quality of the whiskey coming out, where you get some of the new entrants into the business and they're saying, oh, I don't care how much it costs me to make this barrel of whiskey. I'm just going to aim for making the best barrel of whiskey that I want to right? And thank goodness we've got some of those guys starting in the business because they'll change everything just like the craft brewers have changed the beer business. Let them, let them take the risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're in that area because one of the first times I ever met you both, you said, we want to make the best whiskey. That was it. And it's, uh, right. We know we'll never make it, but we're going to keep striving for it every batch. That's every day we're going to try and do a little bit better and just you know, get closer and closer. It's a pretty elusive target. Because yeah. even if you made it, the next day you could make an even better one. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. That's the idea. Well, and everybody's palate is a little bit different. Yeah. And so what what person's best is not the other person's yeah. best. So it's there's no movie. there's no best there's no best whiskey but, in the world. There's just lots of whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. The last whiskey the Summerton Club sent out <laughs> is the world's best whiskey at that point yeah. in time. <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's the gospel good, according yeah. to Dan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it lasts for two months, and that is the world's best whiskey. <laughs> whiskey <laughs> timeline and the Summerton Club, and after that, only Summerton Club bottles existed in the world. Yeah, issue issue will be as we write it. Yeah, precisely as it was. <laughs> when we got into this business, we weren't whisk by far whiskey experts. We enjoy drinking whiskey every once in a while, but if that's half the fun of what we're doing now is learning and connecting, going seeing other distilleries, seeing what they're doing. Yeah. And it's uh, it does it makes it uh, it makes it a little bit uh, a little bit more interesting because you have a very open mind on what mm, whiskey. Can love be. it, yeah, love it. And I just happened to marry a guy with a good <laughs> palate. That's my <laughs> kind of people. Beautiful. All right. Well, look, you know, John and Bob, you know, thanks very much for for joining us today. Um, I think yeah. um, we really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Well, if you're. You're very Thank welcome. you, and we look forward to seeing you here at Blackhawk. I've literally never been to Canada. It's on my list of countries that I really must visit. I've been to a lot. I've been to like 65 towards 70. So it's not like I don't travel. Okay. I've just never been to Canada. So, yeah. There you go. Now you've got a reason to go. 
Best, world's <laughs> best whiskey right now. Best. You, see, you need to change that Summerton website. Down. The new, the the new world's yeah. best whiskey. You could have your yeah. own awards. Just complete rebrand every two months. Yeah, you run yeah, a new yeah. awards, and guess yeah. what? Summerton wins. <laughs> We've got six awards to give away this year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, it's been lovely so talking yeah. to you, and uh, just keep doing thank what you're you. doing and experiment, go wild, and I'd love to see how that new grain works out for you. Well, and same goes to you guys. It's nice to see guys like you taking the time out of their week yeah. to do a podcast and let people kind of join in on the journey of exploring new flavors and stuff like that. It does a good service to a lot of people because that is their entertainment. That's part of their drinking yeah. whiskey, right? Yeah. So, on you guys, well it takes a lot of work. It does. And uh, yeah. you guys are extremely professional. No, nice I mean, look, it's the first time that's ever been said. Yeah, that's, that's very, very kind of you. It's usually a bit more degenerate than this, but it's been. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got a tear. <laughs> but look, I mean, from our perspective, I mean, um, the same for you two to take the time out to come on, Dan as well. Mm. Dan's going to stay on for a bit longer. We're going to just um, rip down a bit more. And then, um, you know, also to, to be trying this whiskey and hearing the stories, is, you know, look, it's a beautiful thing. So really, thanks very yeah. much. And I actually really liked your website as well. I'd already been on it. And um, uh, I found the certificate, by the way, just by Googling the words. And Google always takes you to yeah. the exact page, um, you know, <laughs> and... Um, I can help. Whiskey certificates at the bottom of the page. You see, anyone yeah, listening? It's a- under the logo. Yeah. I found it. <laughs> neither of you can either of you two sing, John or Barb. Can can you two sing? No? Yeah, yeah, you can't sing. Not. That's yeah. such a shame. Because I would have got you to do something. <laughs> it's okay. Dan, can you sing? No. No. Nope. <laughs> No, he cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. All right, guys. So, oh, quality. Thanks, John. Take Thanks, Bob. Yeah, thank right. you. Take care. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. <laughs> yeah, there's one thing I'd like to add. Um, everyone should follow Black Fox Farm and Distillery on social media. And just quickly looking. So, on Twitter, they are at Black Fox Spirits, and Instagram, they are Black Fox underscore farm. So, yeah, go and have, go and have a check them out thank you once again for listening that's going to be the end of episode 15 uh we're going to split this up into two episodes again because we have talked our rear ends off so yeah thank you to dan for popping on we'll catch up with you in the second half uh thank you to john and barb for coming on uh thank you for duncan as always to be my co-host uh check us out online at honest to a malt on twitter instagram and all those other good things check out the website honest to a malt.com please if you do like the podcast give us a like Give us a review. Give us a subscribe. Do us a favor. Spread the word of the malt. Uh, But thank you very much, and we will catch you on the next one. Take care, guys. Bye-bye-bye.